Hello, everyone, and welcome to part three of Extreme Values. We're going to be starting on page 84 with the extension problems. On the graph below, draw a quartic function with a maximum at 0, 1, and minimums at negative 2, 0, and 3, negative 2, and passing through the points 1, 0, and 4, 0. So go ahead and draw that on your own while I draw it on the board. You should have graphed something that looks like that. So the question says, on what intervals is f of x increasing? Now, before we can answer that question, remember that this graph is going to be the derivative of the function. So I, I don't want you to say, oh, it's decreasing right here. It's decreasing right here. We're doing this opposite. This is the derivative graph. So here's my advice. I personally always change this to a sign chart. Think about this. If I gave you a sign chart and I told you that the graph had a positive slope and then a negative slope and then a positive slope, this would be a piece of cake. You would say, oh, the d function is increasing on this interval because it has a positive slope. So I'm going to change this to a sign graph. Very, very tricky. Here's how I'm going to do it. All these numbers are positive, so the slope is positive. And then the slope stops for a second. It's at zero, but then the slope is positive again. It's not until here that the slope, because this graph tells us about the slope, is negative, and it's negative through this whole thing. And then it becomes positive again. All right. I realize that this is tricky. Let me explain that again. While the slope of f prime is negative, the value of f prime is positive. And that's what I really want to know. So I would ignore the red graph now, and I would just look at the green sign chart. So on in what intervals is f of x increasing? So since this is my f prime chart, it must be increasing from negative infinity to negative 2, and then something happens at negative 2, and then from negative 2 until 1, and then from 1, 2, 3, 4 to infinity. The next question asks us about concavity. So for concavity, I need the second derivative, and now you can just make your sign chart like you're used to. This slope Second derivative will be the slope of the first derivative. The slope is negative until two, negative 2. And then the slope is positive until 0. And then the slope is negative from 0 to 3. And then the slope is positive again. So where is this going to be concave up? It's going to be concave up from negative 2 to 0, and then from 3 to infinity. At which x-coordinates does f of x have local extrema? So extrema is just a way of saying maximums and minimums, all in one word. So a minimum always occurs when something changes from negative to positive, because it means it had a, when the derivative changes from negative to positive, because it means it was falling and then rising. So I go back to my sign chart, not the graph, and it went from negative to positive right there at 4. So there is a minimum at x is equal to 4. Notice that's why I asked this for the x coordinates. I don't know the y coordinate. I don't have the original graph. Something has a maximum if the slope changes from a positive slope to a negative slope. So on your sign chart, if you go from positive to negative, then you must have a maximum. So mine goes from positive to negative at 1. There's a maximum at x is equal to 1. What are the x-coordinates of all the inflection points of the graph of f of x? So inflection points 
happen whenever you change sign. So inflection points are when f double prime of x changes sign. So for us, that's going to be at negative 2, and then at 0, and then again at 3. All right, now, now we're doing the heart of the problem. Now that we know all this information, can we sketch a possible graph? So since there's a maximum at 1, you don't know the y value. I'm just going to make it 1, 3. It can be whatever you want it to be. There's a minimum at 4. So somewhere at 4. You don't have to draw it down in the negative area. And just to show that I'm actually going to leave it up there. Um, and then there's got to be points of inflection at negative 2 and at 0 and at 3. And even though, even though it's not a max or a min, it did have a derivative of 0 at negative 2. It's almost like it flattened out. So at negative 2, I'm just going to put a little like 0. I want it to have a derivative of 0 right there. So I need to be increasing until negative 2. I'm going to flatten out for a second, but then I'm going to increase some more from negative 2 to 1. And then I'm going to hit my maximum and I'm going to start to come back down. Now, let's just check out points of inflection. Did I inflect at negative 2? Oh, I definitely did, right? Like, see how I was kind of concave down? And now I'm kind of concave up. But then it inflected again at zero. So that's how you got that little squiggle thing going on there. And then it's going to come back down. So this is concave down. Can you see that concave down? And then concave up. And then somewhere right around zero, it switched back to um, uh, concave down again. So this whole it needs to be concave down until three. So somewhere around three doesn't matter the height, I just was trying to make it kind of match. It's going to switch to concave up again, and I'm going to have a minimum at x is equal to 4. So somewhere around here, it switches from being concave down, and now it's going to be concave up again until the end. Okay, that's my possible graph. All right, we are actually going to do another one like that, but we're going to take a break and do something that's give your mind a second to rest on that, and we'll do another one in this, uh, like that in a minute. Let's do something that we know. SVA. A particle is moving along the x-axis with a position function. x is equal to 2t cubed minus 14t squared plus 22t. Really made that way too close. Um even though we're calling it SVA, in this case it's XVA. All right, so the first thing I always do is I just write the three equations. So I have them, and then I try and figure out which equation matches the information that I need. So 6t squared minus 28t plus 22, and the acceleration is 12t minus 28 find the velocity and the acceleration. Oh, see, they wanted that anyway. And describe the motion. So these words are always going to mean, tell me when it's going left, when it's going right, when it's stopped. Or if this is uh, moving along the x-axis, if it was up and down, where it was going up, where it was going down, where it was stopped. So what determines that? That is determined by velocity. Left is a negative velocity. Right is a positive velocity. And stopped is a zero velocity. So we need to set this equal to zero. Zero is equal to 6t squared minus 28t plus 22. I see a t squared in my equation. What do I do? I set it equal to zero and I factor. Uh, I can't take a 6 out. I can only take out a 2. So 2 gives me 3t squared minus 14t plus 11. 
now that you took the two out, hopefully it's a little more obvious because it has to be 3t and t, and it has to be 11 and 1. Those are the only two choices. But you don't want the 11 times the 3. So I'm going to put the 11 here and the 1 there. So either 2 is equal to 0 or 3t minus 11 is equal to 0 or t minus 1 is equal to 0. Well, 2 is not equal to 0. So either t is equal to 11 thirds or t is equal to 1. So let's make our derivative sign chart. So velocity is the first derivative of the distance equation. So my first derivative sign chart has a 1 on it, and this is 3 and 2 thirds. So if I plug in a number like 5, 5 is going to make this positive, this positive. If I plug in a number like 2, this will be negative, but this will be positive. And if I plug a number like 0 in, they'll both be negative, which gives us a positive. So now I know that the particle was moving to the right when it started. Then it was moving to the left. And then it was moving to the right again. And it was stopped at, z at time 1 second and time 3 and 2 thirds second. So another way of describing it is it stopped and it turned around. And that's how you would describe it. Okay, so back to the little bit tougher ones. Again, you've been given a derivative. I actually think that this is easier for people because they weren't given the graph. Instead, you were just given the function of the derivative. 4x cubed minus 12x squared. Remember, what do we really want from this? We want a sign chart. The sign chart on the derivative tells us where it's increasing slope, decreasing slope, or zero slope. So let's set it equal to zero. I can factor out a 4x squared, which leaves me with x minus 3. So either x is equal to zero or x is equal to 3. I make my sign chart. If I pick a number bigger than 3, like 4, it's positive. If I pick a number like 1, it's negative. And there's going to be at least one person that's going to make me very upset. They're just going to think that it goes positive, negative, positive. But it doesn't. If you pick a number like negative 1, then you're going to have negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4, but this is still positive. You're actually going to get negative. So think about graphically what's happening. Graphically, this is a cubic function that has only two zeros at zero and at three. So it bounces, goes like this. So the derivative is, remember this is a graph of the derivative. The derivative is all negative numbers and then it's positive numbers. Remember that the graph itself, a little tricky. So bounces are always going to cause the graph to have two signs that are the same in a row. You need to be watching out for that. Okay, but because the graph will confuse some people, I'm going to erase it. Just stick with the sign chart. So if this is the y prime chart, if the slope is negative, even if it stops at zero, slope is negative, negative again, that wasn't very negative. The graph is negative, zero, and then negative again, and then it's positive. This is a minimum. Whenever the first derivative goes from negative to positive, that's a minimum. So there's a minimum at x is equal to 3. But there's nothing at 0. There's only going to be a max or a min if the derivative changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. But now I have a pretty good idea of what this graph is going to look like. Find the intervals on which f of x is increasing from 3 to infinity and decreasing from negative infinity to 0 and then from 0 to 3. Find where the graph of f of x is concave up. Concavity is always going to be second derivative. So my second derivative is 12x squared minus 24x. I can take out the 12x and I get x minus 2. 
if I want to know the points of inflection, I set it equal to zero. Points of inflection are not necessarily where it's equal to zero, but where it changes from positive to negative. So we'll have to make a sign chart again. 12x times x minus 2. So my two candidates are x is equal to zero and x is equal to 2. I make my y double prime chart and I label it. Notice I labeled this one y prime, y double prime. Always label. Make sure everybody knows exactly what you're doing with your work. And now when I plug in a number like 3, it's positive. I plug in a number like 1, and it's negative. And plug it into the factored form, it's the easiest. And when I plug a number like negative 1 in, this is negative, and this is negative, so it's positive. So there is a point of inflection at 0, and there's another point of inflection at 2. If this had been our y double prime chart, there would have been no point of inflection at zero. Can't be negative, negative. Find where the graph is concave up. Concave up is going to be from negative infinity to zero. And then again from two to infinity. And where is it concave down? Between zero and two. Remember that is an interval, not an ordered pair. That notation drives me crazy. Not an ordered pair. All right, sketch a possible graph. So I actually kind of did that over here, right? When I was saying that it was going down, it flattened out for a minute, it went down. But I really went in a pretty straight line. Now I know something about its concavity. So I need to make sure I have a minimum at three so let's make it 3, negative 2, like whatever you want. And then I need it to have a little bit of a flat spot at 0. Let's do 0, 2 and a half. I'm going to make my flat spot right there. And I need to have some change in concavity. So it needs to be concave up until the 0. And then it needs to be concave down after the 0. But then it needs to switch to concave up again. So you see how that concavity really helped me make this graph that I had a really good idea of what it looked like. It was falling, it was flat, it was falling, it went back up. But now that I've added the concavity to it, I have a much better idea of what it looks like. All right, a little question that's supposed to get you ready for the next unit. Find three different functions with derivatives equal to this one. So our next unit's gonna be on doing derivatives backwards. So if you think about how we do derivatives forward, you always do 3 times 4, and then you drop the power. So we're going to do the opposite. We're going to raise the power, and we're going to divide. Instead of multiplying by the 3, after we raise the power, we're going to divide. So minus 12x to the third, and divide. But here's the catch. There could have been something here, right? There, there could have been a number like plus 8. And if there had been an 8 there, when you took the derivative, it would have gone away. So you don't really know what number's there. So f of x could be, we'll just simplify this, x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 8. Or it could be f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 2. How long can I do this? I can do this all day. Luckily, they only asked for three. Because this last number could be anything, right? Because when you take the derivative of this, you're going to get 4x cubed minus 12x squared, and this number is going to go away. Now, if I were to graph all of these, all right, if I'm actually going to graph all of these, let's make it a little bit of a more reasonable number. If I were to graph all these, then they would all look the same. They would all have this basic shape that I've already figured out. But one would be crossing at 8, and another one would be crossing at 2, and another one would be crossing at negative 2. So next unit, we're going to be calling them f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus c where C represents a constant. 
So now you got a little sneak peek at next unit. All right, we have one more for today. The function f of x is continuous on the interval negative 4 to 4. Its derivative is defined as follows. All right, so you know I say this a lot. If you really want to practice your piecewise functions, you should stop the video and see if you can make this uh, graph this function on your own. But you know I'm going to do it for you, so you can just let it run. So this is a polynomial function. Uh, specifically, it's a parabola. I personally think the easiest way to graph a parabola, if it's factorable, is to factor it and plot the zeros. So I know that the x-intercepts are at negative 3 and negative 1. I know its y-intercept is at 3, which means its axis of symmetry has to be here, which means this is also a point on the graph. So literally... I can make such a nice graph with such little effort. Okay. I only want to go from negative four, closed circle, to zero, open circle. Make sure you're paying attention to those things. You don't actually need the line of symmetry. I'm just trying to show you that it's there and that it helps me graph. Now I'm going to graph the line x minus 1. I'm only going to go from 0 to 2. So since it's a line, the easiest thing to do is just to graph the endpoints. So at 0, I'm at negative 1, open circle. And then at 2, I'm at positive 1. Um, at 2, I'm at positive 1, also open circle. There's my line. And this last one, people do have a lot of trouble with. Um, because they are confused that it's just a number. But if you're ever confused, always write y is equal to. And then I think it's obvious. y is equal to 2. You're like, oh, I know what that is. That's a straight horizontal line at negative 2. And it is. But it's not going to go all the way across. It's just going to go from 2 right here, open circle, to 4, closed circle. All right, we've graphed our piecewise function. Remember, this is the derivative. This is not the actual function. So I know we've only done one of these. I'm going to say it again, though. Personally, if I'm ever given the derivative graph, I always change it to a sign chart. I think that that is the easiest way to do this problem because that's what you're used to looking at. It's the best thing to look at. You want to know where the derivative is positive or negative. So... Let's do it with a highlighter this time. The derivative is positive here, here, and here. Do you see why? Not with, I don't want to look at the slope of this graph. I want to look at the actual value of the derivative. And the value of the derivative is positive. It's a positive number until, where are we? One, two, three. Negative three, positive. And then it's a negative number until negative 1. And then it's a positive number until 0. And then it's a negative number until 1. And it's a positive number until 2. I'm not really lining it up anymore. I should do it off to the side. And then it's a negative number after that. So it's positive until negative 3 negative until negative 1, positive until 0, negative until 1, positive until 2, and then negative. So now forget the graph. Once you've converted it to a sign chart, it's so much easier. Where do maxes and mins occur? The graph must be rising and then falling. So there's a max at x is equal to negative 3. But then the graph is falling and then rising. So there must be a minimum at x is equal to negative 1. And that's falling, or rising and then falling. So there must be a max. And then there must be a min. And then there must be a max. So interesting, right? But now we're going to do second derivative. This is going to get a little bit crazy. So I'm going to put it underneath here. 
Okay, so second derivative, remember, that is the slope of the first derivative. Now you want to talk about slope. So this slope is negative through this whole portion, negative slope, until right there, negative 2. And then it has a positive slope all the way until 0. And it takes a break, but look, now it has a positive slope again until 2. And then it has no slope or zero slope. So how does that affect concavity? That means I need to draw something that is concave down until two, concave up until zero, concave up from zero to two, and then no concavity at all. So why does it have no concavity? Because its slope, remember this graph is the derivative, which is the slope. The slope is constantly negative two. So I'm going to draw a line that has a slope that is constantly negative 2 when I get there, when I try and graph it. All right, I can't stress enough. You will learn more about this problem if you don't just watch me do it. You should really try and put all these little puzzle pieces together. You know where the maxes are. You know where the mins are. You know about the concavity. And if you are going to try it on your own, I'll give you a little hint. You know there's no derivative at 0. Do you see how it's an open circle in both spots? And there's no derivative. What causes something to have no derivative? No derivative is caused by points of discontinuity. That causes no derivative. Cusps cause no derivative. Corners. Or anything that is pointy. So keep that in mind as you try and draw it. Okay, either welcome back or shame on you if you're just going to let me do it for you. All right, so I need a maximum at negative 3. So at negative 3, and I'm going to make it high to make sure I can move, maneuver. I have to go max min, max min. And then I want a minimum at negative 1. And then a maximum at 0. It's pretty close by, so I'm actually going to not go up very high. And then another minimum at 1, so I'm not going to go too low. Maybe I'll just go right there. I don't want you to think it has to be right at a point of intersection. And then another maximum at 2. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall the rest of the way. So I need it to be concave down until 2. I can do that. Concave down. And now I'm going to switch to concave up. Now here's the tricky part. It's concave up from negative 2 to 0, which I did. But now it's concave up again from 0 to 2, which would look like this. So be careful. It's, it's going to go like this, pointy. Not, wait, not, you're not going to try and squeeze a little hump in there because that would change the concavity from concave down or from concave up to concave down. And you're not trying to do that. You are concave down, and then right there, you switch to concave up, and then you stopped, and you're concave up again. And now, zero slope, and what is that slope? Or zero concavity, what is the slope? Negative two. Does your graph have to look exactly like this? No, it could be shifted left, or uh, up, down. But its general shape does have to look like this. If you're at all thinking to yourself, ooh, I kind of followed that, but I'm not sure I could do it on my own, that's okay. You don't have to do this on your own yet. We're going to practice this a ton before you're required to do it on your own. That's why it was called an extension topic. We're just, just trying to get your, your mind wrapped around this. All right, good job. That is the end of Extreme Values. That was part C. And I hope you have a great day.